Okay, so there's a question that came up, and people were confused. They said, well, why in the heck is it that when you have these calcium channels open up, oh, that's the best slide to show it. Yeah, here, so looking at this, like, you know, if you just have straight up calcium channels opening up, how come you don't have this voltage continuing to increase, right? So there's obviously some sort of counterbalance happening here. And we said, okay, well, you know, around phase one, this is when you have those, uh, those uh, potassium channels start to close, but the calcium channels are opening up. What's actually happening here is there's a couple of different types of potassium channels that are out there. There's kind of the fast uh, responding ones, which kind of happen early on. Those that, in that kind of during phase zero to phase one kind of area. Um, there's also going to be the kind of delayed rectifier potassium channels. They're a little bit slower acting. That's going to be the counterbalance to the calcium coming in. Okay, so there's going to be some calcium efflux or uh, calcium influx occurring here, and then also some degree of potassium efflux. That's kind of the balance here. But the main thing to focus on are like what are the main ion flows that are causing the different phases here. So like for phase zero, the main thing is sodium influx. For phase two, it's going to be this calcium influx that leaves that plateau that's occurring. And then for that phase three, when you have the repolarization, the big thing is going to be potassium efflux is the primary mover, right? And then, you know, now you have the repolarization, sodium potassium pumps going, and that should keep everything at the resting membrane potential. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of overlap there. So the, the yeah, slow potassium channels are actually those delayed rectifier, they call them, are, are probably opening a little bit sooner than that, right? So there's some overlap when and when uh, some of the channels are closing and opening, but I'm just trying to show you guys like primarily um, what are the main movers and shakers because of the fact that when you're looking at things like drug therapy, you'll see that this is, these are the main things we're targeting, right? So for instance, when we give a drug that blocks those potassium channels, that delayed rectifier, that's primarily going to be affecting phase three. So I can do things like prolong my QT interval, right? Or I can do things like I can block um, the sodium channels. I can delay that depolarization in phase zero. I can slow that down. Or if I affect the calcium channels, I can affect that plateau effect, right? So we have calcium channel blockers that can do that. Does that make sense? Okay, any other questions I can answer before we do the Kahoot? All right, I'll give people a few seconds. To... I hope Pepsi better than Coke wins. I agree. <laughs> I think so, yeah. You're not able to get in? Okay. I can't remember. You can also do it on your phone if you want. You have lots of options. <laughs> All right. One more minute here. I know who you are now. <laughs> Get you out. You should be able to hop back in. Yeah. <laughs> okay, there's a lot. Of... Alright, everyone ready to. Cool, we good? Alright, you got 64 players. Alright, let's start. All right, so we're doing the we got 37 questions here. So a few more than the last time. So hopefully, you guys will get some ideas of what's going on. Uh, patient is deficient in folic acid, which would develop which of the following problems? What do we think? Uh, sure, if someone wants to grab that. I'm actually, I guess I'm not tied to the thing. Here. <laughs> You guys remember what folic acid was used for when producing red blood cells? To produce some of those, some of that DNA, right? To help make some of those base pairs. 
So you get a megaloblastic anemia. All right, so most people got that. So when do you get sickle cell uh, anemia? When does that occur? Remember, so that's when those patients end up having uh, they end up having an amino acid switch on their hemoglobin, one of the chains, and so that's what leads to that kind of precipitation, leads to those crystals kind of forming out. Uh, how about a microcytic anemia? What's going on there? Yeah, it's usually iron deficiency, so the, the red blood cells don't really have a ton of uh, hemoglobin in them due to iron deficiency. Uh, and then that erythroblastosis fetalis, what is that? Yeah, so it was the mom was generating antibodies against the uh, the RH on, on a, on a uh, fetus. Good, and then so megaloblastic anemia. So basically, we're not getting like really mature red blood cells um, because we can't produce like you know enough DNA in order to uh, allow those kind of mitotic effects to occur. So that's where you're kind of stopping the red blood cell kind of maturation process short, essentially. Good. Okay. Next up. So the following is not a way that CO2 is transported in the blood. That did not go so well. <laughs> I was trying to subscript or superscript that, but I don't know why that came up that way. It's weird. What do we think? So that first one should be HCO3 minus. What is CO? Carbon monoxide, right? So you don't really want a lot of that in your system. Uh, where can you get carbon monoxide from, like in the environment? Fires, yeah, fire's a big one. Car, yeah, so like you ever have a car running in the garage, like that can either do an intentional attempt or someone accidentally left it running. I've had uh, several kids, you know, uh, young drivers who have accidentally left the car running in the garage. I always thought that was so odd. Like, why, why, how would you ever leave your car running? But it happens. Um, yeah, so that can certainly cause a whole household to actually be affected based on the way that the airflow occurs within the house. But yep, so uh, it can, so it gets uh, converted over to that bicarb, so that's uh, where the majority of that uh, CO2 is going to be carried, right? Um, CO2, where are that going to be carried at? This is just gets dissolved in the, in the plasma, right? So some amount of it will be dissolved there. And then what was that carb, carb amino hemoglobin? Yeah, so once it gets into the uh, red blood cell, it can attach to that hemoglobin to be carried there to some degree. Good. Okay, which of the following locations are red blood cells made in a 63-year-old female? Answering this too quick, I must have taught you too well. Or the answer is too easy. Right, the vertebrae. All right. So, why is the answer the vertebrae? Why not uh, something like the the femur or the tibia? Yeah. All right. So you end up losing those over time, right? So around the time like you're 20 to 30, you lost a lot of uh, the long bones production, um, but the vertebrae stays active. Uh, where else could it be active at? The sternum is one. The ilia, and then. Uh, the ribs are another good one. Those are kind of the primary ones uh, you can see there. Uh, I'm not sure about the skull. I haven't seen. Yeah, so it maybe has some production there. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, from what I was looking at in the graphs and everything, it looks like almost everything else was uh, pretty much turned down. Um, okay. Not totally wrong. Okay, but it's, it's good to know where the primary spots are going to be uh, producing those. So again, the, the main thing is that you're going to be losing some of that production over time, uh, especially as you get older, you're going to have uh, more production in those uh, specific bones. Okay. It'll be pretty clear on the test though what the answer will be if you know these facts. Okay. Blackenstein up front, all right. Okay, let's see. Uh, removal of the thymus would interfere with processing of which cell? Pretty smart. All right. Yeah. So, what is the what is the thymus really used for? 
process process the T lymphocytes. What does it do there, though? Why does how does it process it there? Yeah, so it's making sure that it's going to try to challenge the T cells with our own self antigens. If anything uh, attacks it, then it says, okay, this is not a good T cell. Let's go ahead and get rid of it. Okay, so that's uh, the main kind of processing process there. Where would these other cells be getting made at? That was in the marrow, right? Yeah. All right. Continuing on, you get some harder questions. Uh, which of the following patients would have an increased preload? Patient who is abusing diuretics to lose weight. Patient who is blood doping with their own stored blood. Someone who suffered dehydration after working outside. Or a patient who smoked crack cocaine causing hypertension. <clears throat> These are my favorite kind of questions. So we have to kind of like do it a little bit more. Okay, so why is this the correct answer? Yeah, all right, so we have more blood getting, uh, basically the whole volume of the blood is going to be going up, so more of it's going to be coming back into the heart, right? Um, the reason why the patient who smoked crack cocaine would not cause hypertension is because that's mainly going to be like an arterial constrictor, which would be affecting what more often? The afterload, right? So the afterload would be certainly increased there. Um, you don't see a ton of that preload effect because, again, the veins are very compliant. They're able to hold that extra blood. So even if your arteries are really uh, going to be constricted down, the veins can kind of compensate for that, right? So you don't necessarily see a ton of preload effect. All of it's mainly going to be the afterload effect there, okay? Um, obviously, the person who's dehydrated, that would be reducing the preload. And someone who's abusing diuretics to lose weight would also be dropping preload at that point, right? Because the blood volume would be down in total. Great. So a chronic alcoholic develops liver failure, which clotting factor could be affected? Hmm. Which production of a clotting factor could be affected? <laughs> Seems confident. <laughs> Shh. It's competitive. You're supposed to be like knocking down your classmates trying to get the right answer. Yeah. <laughs> Everywhere else is cooperative. You guys are all meant to help you know raise each other up, but this time you want to like try to knock down your other one. Okay, so so what is factor four? Does anyone know? It's actually calcium, right? So calcium doesn't really get produced in the liver. It's all going to be through diet or from the bones and all of that. So that's that would not be the correct answer. Um, what is factor three? That's that tissue factor, right? So that's going to be the thing that kicks off which pathway? Extrinsic. Extrinsic pathway, yeah. So it kicks off the extrinsic pathway, so that would not be correct because I'm producing the liver there. Uh, factor 12, also not produced in the liver. Where does that get used at? Mm, it's going to be more on the intrinsic side. The main thing to focus on, um, and the point here is to look at like things like your, your uh, vitamin K dependent factors. So like 2, 7, 9, and 10 are some of the big ones that require vitamin K in the liver to actually be produced. There's a few other factors that get produced in the liver as well, but those are the primary ones that we'll kind of run into issues with when you have a patient who has like really bad liver failure. Okay, So the vitamin K uh, epoxide reductase, that whole pathway ends up taking a hit, and then they, they start to lose uh, some of these factors there. So that's when you see their, their PT INR go up. That's really going to be much more kind of, uh, that's a better test to use when you're looking for those vitamin K dependent uh, clotting uh, factors. Right. If you're looking at something like a heparin that would be affecting like um, like 2, 9, 10, 11, and 12, like that would be more looking at your APTT. Um, so you guys will learn that distinction uh, later on when you get into um, other classes. Yeah, so factor 7 would be the correct answer there. All right. Moving on. Outward flow of which ion is responsible for the repolarization phase and the myocardial action potential? Pretty easy for you guys. Just covered it. Right, so 
the repolarization phase, right, that phase three is primarily going to be that outward flow of potassium. That is the main thing that's causing the resting or the membrane potential to go back down close to uh, baseline. And then that sodium potassium ATP is pumped over that takes over for maintaining that, right? Um, now, if I said like phase zero or that depolarization, what would be the correct answer? The inward flow of sodium, right? So inward flow of sodium at phase zero will cause the depolarization. The outward flow of potassium causes that repolarization. Okay. So this is like a primary drug we see like with the, uh, we'll talk about antiarrhythmics, but amiodarone is a really big one that affects this potassium and can have uh, good effects on for treating a lot of ventricular type arrhythmias. Okay. Any questions on that? All right, not seeing a lot of changes here. Flagging sign still killing it. Okay, so when examining lead V2 on an EKG, which would be the negative, uh, which is the considered to be the negative lead? Remember, you're looking from the positive end. That's where the camera is looking from. Where is it going to be terminating at? I thought it was really, really good. Yeah. Who watched the video? EKG. Do you guys like it? Was it good? Yeah, I thought it was a very succinct description of uh, EKGs. Right, so this would be the center of the heart, right? So when looking at these leads, uh, when you're looking at your precordial leads, they're going to be like V1 through V6. Again, the machine is kind of able to calculate where the center of the heart or where the negative would be. So when you're looking at it, it would be basically going from, uh, you know, say V2 over here on the left side of the chest going straight into looking into the heart. The center of the heart would be considered the negative lead at that point, right? That's kind of where it's looking at. Um, when you're looking at like your bipolar leads, obviously that'll start to change a little bit, okay? Um, we'll go, there's another question that kind of goes over that a little bit. We'll kind of examine that in a few minutes. Yes, ma'am. AVR, AVF, and AVL are all going to be using the, the center of the heart as kind of the theoretical uh, negative there, right? And so you're actually not putting an electrode into the center of the heart, but the machine is able to calculate it essentially for you. It's able to kind of compensate for that. Okay. Very good. So important concept to get there. Because again, when you're looking at those the pre leads, you're trying to get those different kind of axes uh, of looking at the heart to see how things are differing. So you can see things like, you know, if there's myocardial ischemia in one section of the heart versus the other, primarily on the left side, you're going to be able to detect that. And you can see where it's at. That can lead you to um, catheterizing one coronary artery versus another because you are, you know, suspecting that this one is the one with the blockage, et cetera, right? Okay. Uh, Slack and science out of the top five. I don't know. Okay. There's too many slags, so it's hard to tell. All right, so if I had a patient with a serum pH of 7.24, a bicarb of, say, 20 millimoles, and then a PCO2 of 40 millimeters of mercury, this would be considered what? You guys remember that table? I'll put normal values on the test, but. Uh, So 40 was considered the normal uh, CO2, and then 24 was considered the normal bicarb. Um, yeah, so like if you're looking at like an entitled CO2, like 35 to 45 might be what you're looking at. Yeah, so you're right. But we're just using like 40 as kind of like the, the center of that. So, okay, so the first thing you're doing when you're assessing these acid-base disturbances is one, you're checking your pH, right? So based off the pH, we are acidotic, right? So you already know it's an acidosis, okay? It's not compensated yet. If we came back and it was, uh, you know, within 7... 3.5 to 7.45, we would know it's compensated somewhere based on the other changes that would happen there. But we know we're acidotic already, and so we know that bicarb is high or low. It's low, so bicarb is low, and then our PCO2 is it's normal at this point. So this would be considered metabolic acidosis, right? So again, the, the bicarb is low, 
that's telling you that, hey, we don't have enough bicarbonate to buffer the system. So we're probably more acidotic, and then the patient is acidotic, so that was leading you to say that's the actual cause of it. Okay, so you guys will do these interpretations. This will become kind of second nature to you after a while when you're looking at ABGs, comparing it with their basic metabolic panel. You can look at it and say, okay, well, is this respiratory in nature? Is this metabolic in nature? Um, we do this very frequently in, um, in the tox world when we're trying to assess these patients for especially metabolic acidosis. Like you see that a lot more frequently with um, a lot of overdoses. I, I mentioned that mud piles. Have you guys ever had heard that before? Yeah, so it's a very common thing we do up in our differential to look for reasons why a patient may be acidotic, right? So if things like uremia, okay, I can rule that out, patient has good kidney function. I can rule out DKA, the glucose is normal. So you rule out and that kind of helps to narrow your differential a little bit to try to get to, okay, what specifically is causing this problem here? All right, so in this case, this patient will be in metabolic acidosis. How would the body compensate to correct this? Yeah, it would increase ventilation to lower PCO2, and that way it would get rid of extra acid, right? That in that case, if you saw that the PCO2 was down to say like 30, and then the pH was back up to a normal range, you would say that is, yeah, it's a compensate. So it's a metabolic acidosis with respiratory compensation. Okay, and so we see this a lot when um, I do like aspirin overdose is a really good example. So aspirin, did I mention this example in the, in the lecture? Right, so with aspirin overdoses, you stimulate the respiratory drive. It just has that effect the drug does. Um, so patients end up hyperventilating. They end up blowing off a lot of CO2. So they end up starting out with what? Respiratory alkalosis, right? Because they're hyperventilating. So they get respiratory alkalosis. Then the kidneys want to compensate for that. They want to get rid. Of, they want to uh, bring that pH down. So what do they do? They get rid of bicarb, right? So they start to pee out the bicarb. And so then at that point, they, once they start to pee out the bicarb, bicarb starts to get lower. They may compensate, but then you have problems where like aspirin can cause this like overwhelming metabolic acidosis because it actually inhibits oxidative phosphorylation. So they actually can shift the body into going anaerobic metabolism. It gets really bad. Those, those patients get very very sick. Um, but that's one of the things we'll be looking at. We can actually stage patients and say, well, is this a recent ingestion? Is this something that happened a couple of hours ago or is this kind of more late stage? And so that looking at the acid-base balance is, is very useful in helping us to determine that. I know how, how much uh, my, uh, we talked about sphincter tone in uh, dealing with some of these patients. And so if you have a very sick patient like that, like you, your sphincter tone goes up and so you're like, Ooh, okay, we need to treat this patient now, right? Okay. All right, moving on. So which of the following cells would express the CD8 receptor? <coughs> My immunology friends will correct me if I'm wrong on this one. killer cells would be expressing those CD8 receptors, right? What do the, the T helper cells express? Yeah, the CD4 co-receptors, right? And so they can help to stimulate uh, things like the memory cells and, and whatnot. Um, macrophages tend to be more of those kind of antigen presenting cells, right? So they can, uh, you know, break down a, a bacteria or some other pathogen and express that out on the cell surface. So they can uh, start to trigger off some of these other T helper cells and, and things like that. Okay, very good. Which of the following would have a natural antihypertensive effect? So which one of these would naturally lower blood pressure? Body has too high a pressure, it's too much fluid around, what gets released in response to this? Atrial natriuretic peptide or ANP. Okay, so what would norepinephrine, norepinephrine do? Should vasoconstrict, right? Because it can activate not only the beta receptors on the heart to increase heart rate and contractility, but more primarily, you'll see more, norepinephrine has a little bit preferential effect on affecting alpha receptors. So you see a lot better squeeze there on those alpha-1 receptors on the blood vessels, right? So I can increase blood pressure, right? And that's a vasopressor. It's a term we use for drugs that we'll give to patients uh, via continuous drip in order to get their blood pressure up, right? So norepinephrine is a very common one. Sometimes we'll use epi, sometimes dopamine, but uh, norepinephrine is kind of one of our go-to drugs there. Uh, what would antidiuretic hormone do? 
end up holding on to more water, right? So hold on to more water to try to get the osmolarity down in the blood. Um, so that would have more of an antihypertensive kind of effect, also vasoconstrictive uh, to some degree itself. And then what would aldosterone do? Also try to hold on to more salt and water, and then that would also increase blood volume, increase preload, and, and all that. Right. So the only real thing that would have an antihypertensive effect would be that atrial natriuretic peptide, and in which case, what uh, triggers that response? Yep, atrial stretch, right? So atrial stretches, uh, atria stretches, and then it says, okay, we need to get rid of some of this fluid and would and, uh, start to inhibit some of these other uh, steps here. Yeah. All right. Which of the following would cause negative chronotropy? What do we think? What is chronotropy? It's rate of the heart, right? Two theories. Okay. So why would 11 be incorrect? Huh? I'm sorry, why would this yellow be incorrect? I'm sorry, 11. Why, why were the 11 of you incorrect? I'm sorry, I'm, that's, that's a very rude way to say that. Why is yellow incorrect? There you go. Well, so if you look at where the parasympathetic uh, nerves, or the, that vagus nerve is actually innervating the heart, it really doesn't have a lot of effect on the ventricles, right? Uh, it's primarily only going to affect the SA and the AV node primarily going to be affecting that chronotropy, right? So it does not have a ton of effect on actual contractility of the heart. Now, increased sympathetic activation of the ventricles would cause what? Contractility, right? So they would have a stronger squeeze on the heart. That would increase your, your stroke volume in those cases. Um, so that would not be the case. And then increased sympathetic activation. Yeah, that would be a positive chronotrope, right? So we can use things like there's a drug called dobutamine, which is a beta-1 agonist. You could also use something like epinephrine. You could use things like dopamine. Those all would cause increased chronotropy, cause the heart rate to go up. The only thing here is that with the parasympathetic nervous system releasing acetylcholine on those muscarinic receptors, that would be a negative chronotrope. That would slow the heart down. Yes, ma'am. Say that again. Yeah, so the sympathetic nervous system absolutely affects the ventricles in terms of inotropy or that contractility. The parasympathetic nervous system doesn't really affect it very much. You'll, you'll see that innervation. If you look at those um, those pictures, you'll see it really only affects the, the pacemaker cells and the SA and AV node. Mm -hmm. Right, so when we give it, like if you had a patient who um, had, say, like, uh, you guys have ever heard of organophosphates? Yeah, so they're kind of old school pesticides that we used to uh, use and people would accidentally uh, get exposed to them and they overdose on them. And basically what it did was it inhibited an enzyme called uh, acetylcholine esterase, which breaks down acetylcholine. So if you inhibit that, you get a ton of acetylcholine. So patients get very, very cholinergic, right? They have a ton of acetylcholine affecting these muscarinic receptors. Those patients, um, they don't necessarily have poor cardiac output due to the fact that their stroke volume is going down. There's not really a whole lot of innervation there on the ventricles. What you do see, though, is they get very bradycardic because all that parasympathetic activation there are sitting on the, the muscarinic receptors. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we'll probably talk about that at some point if we cover any talk stuff. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so based on your, your sympathetic tone, like how much uh, of those catecholamines the sympathetic nervous system is releasing onto the ventricles, either more or less, that could affect the, the contractility and the inotropy. Yep. All right. Continue on. Which of the following vessels carries primarily deoxygenated blood? <coughs> Guess this one pretty quick. Good. All right, so this is kind of the confusing one because normally you think arteries are going to be carrying. What? 
Yeah, you think arteries, you think oxygenated blood. The heart is the one area where that's not true because really arteries are just things that are carrying blood away from the heart. Veins are just things carrying blood back to the heart. Um, so in this case, when you're leaving the right ventricle, that's going into the pulmonary arteries, that's going to take it to the lungs where it can be oxygenated and then come right back, okay? All right, remember like the carotid sinuses is mainly going to be coming off of the aorta, like going heading up to the head, so that, that would be primary oxygenated blood there. Uh, pulmonary veins are going to be what's coming out of the lungs back into the left atria. All right. And hopefully your aorta is carrying oxygenated blood, otherwise you're in a bad state, so. All right. How about a patient with abnormally slow breathing would be termed? You guys learn some medical terminology, maybe? Very nice. What would apnea be? No breathing, right? So it's not just slow breathing, it's no breathing, right? So that would uh, not be the correct answer. Um, hyperpnea would be considered what? So ticket, so this is kind of odd because if you look at the actual definitions, like there's a little bit of overlap between tachypnea and hyperpnea. The way we say like if someone is breathing fast, you usually say like they're tachypnic. Um, if they are breathing very deep, like so they're having a lot of, using a lot of accessory muscles, that would be a little bit more kind of considered hyperpnea, right? And con uh, conversely, you'd say a hypopnea if they were having very shallow breathing. So we run into that like opioid overdoses, like um, we run into problems where uh, you can have a patient who say overdose on opioids, a big side effect of that is respiratory depression. And you may be looking at their respiratory rate and they're breathing say 12 times a minute and you're like, okay, well that's, that's good enough for most patients, um, but they could be very hypopnic and they're not actually breathing very deep, right? It could be very shallow and so they're not actually, their tidal volume's low, right? And so they would not actually be exchanging o, uh, O2 and CO2 very well. So that could be uh, kind of a little bit of delineation there between the two. But yeah, so bradypnea would be slow breathing in that case. All right, which valve is heard closing during S1? Give a potty break? I guess. Yes, sir. There's two right answers. Aha. Uh -huh. I won't do that on the test, obviously, but here I'm the game master. I can do whatever I want. So, <laughs> so, right, so basically two names for the same thing, right? It's actually pretty good. I almost had an equal split between the, the two there. Um, right, so basically during S1, what's uh, what else is occurring during S1? Yeah, ventricles are contracting, right? So that increased pressure in the ventricles is going to close the uh, bicuspid or the mitral valve and also the tricuspid valve over on the right side, that's your S1. And then when you have ventricular relaxation, that's eventually when you hear what? <coughs> S2, and that's when, yeah, that's when you get your pulmonic valve and the aortic valve uh, gonna be opening up there, right? Okay, so question wrong. Cedar's still killing it, but it's close race there. Okay, let's see. Um, all right, Sue, so one more question. We can maybe take a break, it's a halfway mark. All right, S1 is heard during which wave of the EKG? This one should be pretty easy based on what we just did. QRS wave. And the QRS wave is, is doing is representing what? Yeah, ventricular depolarization. Good. Uh, the P wave is atrial depolarization. Good. Uh, T wave is ventricular repolarization. What's a U wave? Uh, yeah, so there actually is a U wave. You don't see it very frequently. It's actually, um, some people think it might be the repolarization of like uh, the bundle of his or some of the Purkinje fibers. You don't see it very often, but there actually is a U wave. Here are other things like J waves and all kinds of stuff as you get into other pathology. But um, yeah, so the primary ones, uh, when you have S1, which means you're having ventricular contraction, you're having that depolarization. So you should see the QRS wave roughly at the same time you would hear S1, essentially, okay? 
All right, who needs to take a break? You want to do like a five minute quick break? No? I think you're the only one. Can you hold it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Or you may miss out on a question. I don't know. Are you that competitive that you need to <laughs> hold your wee for a wee? I'm just kidding. There's a, there's a thing uh, many years ago. Uh, someone died from hyponatremic seizures uh, when they had a, the Wii was first coming out, the Nintendo Wii. And so I said, well, hold your Wii for a Wii. And so someone drank as much water as they could without having to go to the bathroom, and then they got really hyponatremic, right? Mm -hmm. So they're probably not expressing a whole lot of antidiuretic hormone at that point. Probably a lot of ANP, right? Probably a lot of that because they're having a lot of atrial stretch. Uh, but they did nothing for their sodium concentration, unfortunately. They really wanted that Nintendo Wii. I think the radio station got, like, sued and it was, it was bad news. Okay, moving on. Which, uh, which LG, I guess, oh, IG, sorry, yeah, that's not lowercase. Which immune globulin, I couldn't, I had no character limit there. Uh, which immune globulin is primarily secreted after immunization has been achieved against a pathogen? Betty, people can interpret my questions better than I can. Very helpful. All right, IgG. Uh, where's IgA primarily excreted? Milk. Mother's milk or um, saliva is another big one. How about IgE? It's more of the allergies. How about IgM? Primary. Yeah, primary response uh, before you actually have developed immunity to it. So IgG would be the primary thing uh, being excreted there. All right, good. It's like when you give a patient uh, immune globulin, that's actually, uh, we're giving kind of a mixture of several different IgGs, um, but primarily it's IgG that we're actually giving them uh, if you ever see that being given uh, exogenously. So if you have something like Kawasaki's disease, if you're a child, like, we'll give IgG there. Um, sometimes if you're having certain like autoimmune conditions, like if you have like thrombocy thrombocytopenic, uh, thrombotic purpura, all right. Whatever, yeah, TPP, um, you can end up having that being given as well. So um, I, IVIG is one of those things where uh, if you're not really sure how to treat the patient, you're like, just try giving them some of that, and hopefully it'll fix it. So you may see that uses kind of like a last resort in a lot of cases. But it's very expensive, so we don't like, the pharmacy likes to hold on to as much as we can. Okay. So which complement protein is responsible for opsonization of these pathogens? putting the icing on the cake, essentially. If you had to, you'd eat cake without the icing, but it's no fun, right? You want to have the icing on it. So what is C1 involved with? Yeah, it's the primary recognition. We have that antibody antigen uh, combination coming up. That's the primary thing. How about C5 and 9? The MAC attack, right? So that's where you're going to actually get the hole put into the bacteria, lice all that stuff out, and then there uh, no more bacteria. So C3 is uh, the primary one used for opsonization, or kind of targeting those cells uh, for macrophages to come in and eat them up, right? OK. Moving on. Mr. Peanut Butter making an appearance. Fantastic. <laughs> All right, baroreceptors react to which of the following stimuli? I guess you should know this one pretty quick. Sure, right? Um, what type of receptors would respond to changes in pH? Chemoreceptors, right? And then how about the osmolality? Osmoreceptor, that's pretty easy, right? Osmoreceptors, osmolality, makes sense. Um, the hydrogen ion concentration would be the same as the pH, so it'd still be the same kind of chemoreceptors there. And pressure would be the baroreceptors. Fantastic. All right. Which of the following is an innate form of immunity?
we think. Yep, there are two correct answers for this one, right? So your macrophages, they're not very specific for any particular pathogen they are working from birth. Uh, the complement system similarly is not very specific. You can attack whatever based on it's uh, getting triggered. Um, why is IgA not considered to be innate? So it's made, like it has to be learned, but also like if you had to consider, would that be active or passive immunity? Passive. That's passive, right? Because you're getting it from someone else uh, in that case. So again, it's not going to be long-term kind of immunity against that. And then the B lymphocytes are obviously going to be kind of that learned immunity, right? So it's not going to be uh, innate. All right. Moving on. Very close. Uh, which of the fung situations would encourage oxygen to disassociate from hemoglobin? So encourage that offloading of hemoglobin. Is that shifting the curve from the left to the right? To the right, yeah. It's to you guys to the right. High hydrogen ion concentrations, right? Um, so high O2 concentrations, we see that as your PO2 increases, that increases the binding for oxygen to hemoglobin. That's why it works in the in the lungs, right? That's why we bind up a lot of uh, oxygen with the hemoglobin in the lungs uh, for onloading. That increases that uh, that association there. Um, low temperature, also another reason why your oxygen is going to be binding to hemoglobin in the lungs. So it's a relatively lower temperature than it would be if you're like say in working muscle tissue, right? It's going to be generating a lot of heat there. Um, how about the low CO2 concentrations? Yeah, also that would end up shifting it back over uh, to the left if you're looking at the dissociation curve. So again, uh, low O2 concentration, or low CO2 concentration, I should say. Um, again, another situation in the lungs where it's uh, promoting, you know, it's lower hydrogen ion concentration, promoting uh, uh, grabbing of oxygen and hemoglobin. Really, when you're in a more acidic environment, that's what's shifting that curve over to the right. So high hydrogen ion concentration would be that case. And consequently, you probably would have high CO2 concentration as well, right? Which of the following molecules serves to hold platelets at the site of vascular injury? Willebrand factor, yes, absolutely. Um, what does ADP do? ADP do? Actually helps to make the platelets more sticky together, right? So you'll find that when we were looking at certain drugs that are used during like an MI or shortly afterwards, after a patient's been catheterized and, and they either had stent placed or had the, the clot fixed, um, you'll find that ADP uh, blockers are used to prevent platelets from sticking together. So for instance, like when a patient goes and gets a stent put in, you guys are familiar with the stent? Basically, it's a sometimes they have like bare metal stems where it's basically just metal kind of mesh that they're putting in the in the coronary artery to keep it open essentially, keep it patent. Um, that is very reactive. The body doesn't like foreign tissues, foreign metals, and plastics and things. And so we use drugs in order to prevent platelets from grabbing onto that. And so we do ADP blockers, uh, being one case. Um, aspirin would be another drug we can use in that case. Um, serotonin. Why is that not the correct answer? Yeah, it causes vasoconstriction, allows uh, usually released by platelets to help uh, also kind of uh, kind of kick off this whole cascade. And what does prostacyclin do? This so dilates. It's primarily going to be kind of antiplatelet. So again, when you have no vascular injury, you want to prevent platelets from grabbing onto the sides of the endothelium. So things like prostacyclin can be useful for doing that. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Which of the following differentiates pacemaker cells from other myocytes?
All right. So you guys remember that picture? I can kind of see that their resting membrane potential is always kind of on this gradual slope up to that threshold, and that's when it can trigger an off an action potential. Um, they do have a refractory period, which is a good thing, because if we didn't have refractory periods, then we could have arrhythmias very easily. You know, other signals could come along and then all of a sudden trigger another action potential, which that could be bad, right? Um, they also do have sodium potassium ATPase pumps. All those myocytes are going to have that. Um, yeah, so otherwise they're all the same except for the fact that they just have that slow inward leak of sodium. That's what's going to allow for the action potential to, to kick off on its own, right? There's the automaticity there because it happens uh, on its own regardless. All right. Which of the following waves represents atrial depolarization? Probably gave this one away already. You guys ever wonder what happened to A through O waves? No idea. Let's probably look that up somewhere. It's like preparation H. Like what happened to preparation A through G? Anyway, um, okay, so yeah, the P wave would be considered that atrial depolarization. Where did where is the uh, atrial repolarization occurring? Yeah, it's during that QRS. You never see it because it basically gets covered up by that larger depolarization of that muscle tissue there. Fantastic. And R and the S wave are all going to be part of the, the ventricular depolarization there. T wave, we said, is, is what? Yeah, repolarization of the uh, ventricle there. Oh, and that last question we mentioned, the refractory period. Um, so why? So we mentioned that's good, that way you don't have uh, these kind of reinsurance arrhythmias occur there. Uh, is it, when do you get to that point where you can have a strong enough signal that could come along and trigger off an action potential? Yeah, so remember there's going to be an absolute refractory period and there's a relative refractory period. Absolute refractory period, nothing can come along and trigger that cell again. Uh, relative refractory period, you can't have something come and trigger it. Yes? Um, ventricular contraction? That's happening uh, like right as that depolarization of the ventricles is occurring, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, during that period, the QRS is what's kicking off the ventricular depolarization. So that's when you start to have the squeeze. And during that repolarization, you're still, that's when it's going, switching from systole to diastole, right? So you kind of look at that table where it's kind of lining up everything together, and you kind of see where uh, the ventricles may still have some squeeze, but they're done depolarizing and they start to repolarize. And that's when after that is when you have the diastole. Yeah. I would, yeah, I would say when, when would ventricular contraction be happening? I'd say during the QRS wave, right? All right. Uh, exposure to which protein kicks off the extrinsic clotting cascade? Oh, let's, let's do it after the answer. But yeah. Okay, so remember when you're looking at the clotting cascade, you'll see that exposure to collagen is kind of what starts the, the intrinsic clotting cascade pathway, okay? Uh, the tissue factor is specifically what's doing the extrinsic. Um, where's fibrinogen involved? It's kind of the end of the pathway, right? It gets turned into. And what does fibrin do? Holds everything. You got all the platelets and some of the RBCs and everything is holding that clot stable. Um, what is it activated by? Thrombin, yeah, so thrombin is going to be the big one there. So factor two, yeah, so factor two is going to kick off that conversion from fibrinogen over to fibrin, uh, and that's going to stabilize your clot there, right? And so you can actually even give um, recombinant thrombin um, into like wounds or something. So if you had like a site of bleeding uh, that was occurring, say, like during surgery, or say, like you had a wound, um, you wanted to stop bleeding, you can actually uh, basically have a, almost like a spray. You can actually spray it onto the wound itself, and it'll start the, the clotting cascade by uh, using kind of one of the most important molecules there, thrombin, because again, you saw thrombin had that feedback mechanism where it would uh, cause a positive feedback loop, cause more clotting to occur. 
So if you hear like thrombin being used during surgery, that's usually what they're using it for, is this, uh, try to kick off a clot to occur very quickly. You had a question? Oh, you want to ask now? No way, everyone can hear. Or? Yeah, so the primary things is that during the repolarization, your sodium potassium ATPS pump starts up, right? right? So it's starting to work there, and the main point there is it's trying to maintain um, trying to maintain that resting membrane potential. But if you think about it, it's going to be kicking out how many sodiums? Three sodiums, bringing in two potassium, right? So you're really not getting a ton of positive outward flow, right? So you're getting like one for every time you use an ATP molecule. It's not super efficient. By opening up a non-specific potassium channel, you just allow all that potassium to kind of flow out along its concentration gradient. So that's where you get a much, um, you know, if it was only the sodium potassium pump going, um, you could probably get to a point where you get back to resting membrane potential. It takes so long though that, you know. There's still a little bit, yeah. But again, it's going against the concentration gradient. But the primary thing is that potassium outward, outward flow, right? So that's why I want you guys to like to know the primary movers of ions during those things. You can get to the minutiae and say, okay, well, yeah, there's a little bit of sodium outward flow, but that, like, clinically, that's not the important thing. The potassium is the important thing there. Because like when you have something like a drug come along and block that potassium channel, that's when you can have things like QT prolongation. You can have uh, torsades develop there. That's what I'm worried about in my patients, right? Okay. Yep, no problem. All right, hopefully I didn't give away a question. Which of the following connections is considered lead three? I found a good mnemonic for this yesterday, so I'll share that one. Left leg to left arm is considered lead three. What's lead one? Right arm and left arm. Yeah, what would be lead two? Right arm, left leg, right? And then what's uh, center of the heart to the right arm? AVR, right? So AVR. Um, what would be center of the heart to the uh, left leg? AVF, so think like AV foot. Uh, and then AVL would be center of the heart to left arm. Yeah, so the, I uh, saw so a mnemonic, so the way you remember your bipolar leads, right, so those are going to be the ones going from limb to limb, um, you do it based on the number of L's that are in the connection, right? So if I'm looking at lead one, it goes from the right arm to the left arm, so there's only one L there, right, it's in the left arm, so that's lead one. If you're going from right arm to left leg, that's two L's, that's lead two. And if you go from left arm to left leg, that's left arm, left leg, three L's, that's lead three. So it may be good to help you guys remember that uh, for future use. Okay. All right, moving on. Cedar pulling ahead. All right. Yeah, where's the slag mater? Gone away. No? Just a couple? Okay. Okay, so a patient suffering from drug-induced agranulocytosis would be deficient in which cells? This one's tricky. What do you think agranulocytosis is? That will inform you. So two correct answers are neutrophils and eosinophils. Okay, so this is tricky because when you look at it, you think, oh, it must be something to do with the agranular cells, right? No, it just means you're lacking granulocytes. Oh, 
right? That's being important because of which cells you actually become deficient in, right? So if I end up having a granulocytosis, I'm actually missing out on my granulocytes. We said which ones are the, the granulocytes? I've never eat bananas, so it's going to be neutrophils, eosinophils, and or basophils you're going to be deficient on. And which one of those gets expressed in the highest uh, percentage? Neutrophils, yes. Yeah. So when you have patients who are neutropenic, they're very, very likely to develop infections, right? So secondary infections are a huge risk for these type of patients. Um, macrophages and B lymphocytes, those are all going to be considered your agranular cells, right? But that's not really what this disease state is kind of referring to. Um, that obviously is not going to be on the test. We didn't cover it in the lectures, but I thought it's a good kind of point to make to you guys to show that, you know, be careful with the names and, and you kind of infer what those are, what those conditions are going to be. I don't know if there's an actual term for that. There probably is somewhere. Um, you don't run into it. AA granulocytosis. I don't know. I do not know. But this is the, the more common thing you run into. So like, there's certain drugs like you have to be on special monitoring programs to make sure this doesn't occur. Um, when we give patients chemotherapy, they become neutropenic, which is kind of a form of agranulocytosis. So that can be uh, very, very dangerous for them because they are at such a high risk for secondary infections. Okay. So I thought that was just kind of an interesting one so you guys at least know that if you hear that term again. Okay. All right, continuing on. Uh-oh, cedar's been displaced. Oh, no. All right. Uh, which muscles are contracting during forceful expiration? And I misspelled. I don't want to enter vostal is, but just assume I'm an intercostal. The spell check on chrome is not super good for medical stuff. Internal intercostals. Okay, why is it not the diaphragm? Yeah, contracting of the diaphragm pulls it down, and that's going to be for inspiration when you're having just normal breathing occurring. During expiration, it just relaxes, right? Um, the external intervostals or costals, uh, the sternocleidomastoid, mastoid are going to be pulling the ribcage up and out. That's going to be your accessory muscles that you're using uh, during forceful inspiration, but the internal intercostals will pull the ribcage back down during forceful expiration. Uh, what other muscle can be used there? <laughs> Yeah, the abdominal muscles also be used when you breathe out uh, very forcefully. Perfect. All right. Close game, close game. Which law is in effect when you have lung volume decreases to increase pressure during expiration? What is Laplace, the law of Laplace? That's to do with the radius of the alveoli and how you uh, will have larger alveoli are going to have lower pressures in them, so you have less kind of diffusion occurring. Uh, like I mentioned that's like during emphysema when you have kind of breakdown of, of the uh, borders between alveoli. That's where you run into this problem where you have less pressure, less uh, you have air trapping that can occur when you have that happen. Um, what about Bohr's law? Hmm. Then the last part. As, yeah, it has to do with the, the hydrogen ion concentration and the affinity for oxygen and hemoglobin. So um, just go back and be kind of familiar with those so you can kind of see what, what the different laws are referring to. Um, again, more important to know the concepts necessarily than be able to, you know, 10 years from now when you're out there practicing to be like, what was Bohr's law? And you're like, I have no idea. But you at least know how hydrogen ion concentration affects hemoglobin binding to oxygen, right? You guys will always remember those concepts, hopefully, uh, at least if you, if you deal with it on a routine basis. Okay. Remember that uh, Boyle's law was just saying that as you uh, decrease the volume that the air is in, uh, uh, the air has to fill, uh, that pressure goes up, and that's what's going to be forcing uh, expiration to occur. So just a little bit, a uh, small increase in pressure is going to leave the air to come out of the lungs through the mouth. Which arachidonic acid product is vasodilatory and antiplatelet? I think I gave this one away already.
Cross to Cyclone, PGI2. What does Thrombox and A2 do? Vasoconstricts, right? It's going to be more kind of pro platelet, uh, if anything. Um, what about leukotrienes? Do you, do you remember where I mentioned those are important? The, the other side of the pathway, so if you were to have um, your prostaglandins uh, being made from arachidonic acid with cyclooxygenase, the other side of that, use lipoxygenase to get your leukotrienes. Those are really important in asthma. So when you look at like uh, leukotriene receptor antagonists and drugs like that, that's mainly going to be affecting asthma. Uh, PGE2 or prostaglandin E2 is really important for like um, cytoprotection with like within the stomach. So that's what is a kind of a potent. Uh, stimulus for secreting that kind of mucous membrane around the stomach that protects you from uh, acids. Uh, it is also uh, something that can induce labor. Uh, it's been used uh, for like chemical abortion before, so it uh, has uh, several uses there, but uh, it's not primarily involved with necessarily the vasoconstriction or dilation, all that. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry? They tend to be more vasoconstrictive or around, or not vasoconstrictive, but they tend to be more uh, uh, bronchoconstrictive, right? So they kind of uh, clamp down on that bronchial smooth muscle and so it kind of impedes that airflow. Yep. Okay, moving on. Cedar taking back lead, all right. Tidal volume plus inspiratory reserve volume equals. Inspiratory capacity, right? So remember your definitions and uh, knowing what those volumes are referring to. Uh, what would be total lung capacity? <laughs> this is going to be everything, right? It's going to be uh, all of your inspiratory capacity plus all the way down, including your, it includes that residual volume, right? Normally it's kind of hard to measure residual volume because that's going to be the air left over after what? After that forceful expiration, that's all the, the residual volume that's left there. You can't really get rid of. And then uh, vital capacity would be what? Yeah, it's everything except for the residual, right? So total lung capacity includes the residual. Vital capacity is does not include that residual. Uh, inspiratory capacity is just going to be your tidal volume plus that inspiratory kind of reserve volume you have there. Okay. Fantastic. All right, moving on. Couple questions left. Uh, delaying the repolarization phase of the myocardial action potential would increase which interval? This one's a little bit tougher, but um, will become important in later classes. This would not be on the test necessarily. We didn't really cover this. This would be like buzz affecting those potassium channels. Was in that repolarization phase. The QT interval, absolutely. So PR interval, right? That's going to be from the atrial depolarization to ventricular depolarization, right? So usually anything that's slowing that is going to be slowing the conduction from like the SA node to the AV node uh, through there. So we don't see a ton of like, especially like medication induced increases in PR interval, but that would be uh, a delay in that, uh, that uh, any that conduction pathway would lead to a PR interval increase. Um, what do you think could cause QRS interval increase? What would delay that depolarization of the QRS or the ventricles? Usually sodium channel blockade. So if you were to block that phase zero, that sodium influx, if you slowed that down by blocking some of those, those channels, you'd see QRS prolongation, right? 
Uh, that could be one thing you see there. So delaying that ventricular depolarization. But then when you uh, slow down that repolarization phase, if you were to like say block potassium channels, that would delay the uh, going from the Q all the way to the T wave, right? So that would be a longer period of time. And so what happened clinically? Why that's important is because when you delay that out. Um, you are extending the period of that, uh, that relative refractory period. And so if you have another rhythm come in, if you have another uh, depolarization happen, you can potentially trigger off an arrhythmia. So that's where you run into that torsades that I mentioned. So if you ever look up pictures of that, you'll see it's very unique kind of looking arrhythmia. Uh, but we worry about that very much from the drug standpoint. We have a lot of drugs that prolong QT interval, okay? We also have a lot of drugs that block sodium channels, cause QRS interval prolongation. So you guys want to learn more about this in like uh, your EKG class and, and other cardio stuff. We'll talk about this a lot when we get to um, the antiarrhythmic section in farm. Right. Uh, beta 2 activation would lead to which of the following physiologic effects? Bronchoconstriction, bradycardia, hypotension, meiosis. Hypotension. What do the beta 2 receptors normally trigger? Usually smooth muscle relaxation, right? So that happens in the lungs. So if you had like a beta 2 agonist, you would have something that would cause smooth muscle relaxation. And you have relief of an asthma attack, right? If you gave albuterol. Uh, if I cause beta 2 agonist, uh, agonism on the vasculature, you end up seeing vasodilation, you have better blood flow to the area. Um, what would cause bradycardia? Hmm? So either uh, muscarinic effect on the heart, right, those muscarinic receptors, uh, or if you were to have, say, like a beta blocker, so a beta 1 blocker in that case, lots like of beta 1 receptors, those are primarily more uh, prominent on the heart, that would slow down the heart rate. Uh, and then what would cause meiosis? So alpha would cause uh, constriction of those, which muscles do you guys remember? You already blocked all that out. Yeah, it causes constriction of the. Remember when you have a fight or flight response, right? People typically dilate or constrict. They dilate, right? So you're having those radial muscles pulling that apart, right? To let more light in. That's going to be alpha one receptor activation, right? So it pulls that muscle apart versus um, something like a, a muscarinic agonist, right? Something that hitting those acetylcholine receptors would cause the circular muscles to constrict, causing meiosis. Okay. All right. Good to know what these receptors do because you can predict what type of effects a patient might experience based on that, right? So I know that if a patient overdoses on cocaine and they're increasing a lot of sympathetic activity, I know I'm looking for uh, mydriasis. I know I'm expecting to see uh, mostly hypertension due to alpha effects. I can expect to see uh, tachycardia due to uh, beta-1 effects. So knowing these receptors is really important to kind of predicting how these drugs are going to act. All right, so during isovolumic dilation, which of the following occurs? Which valves are open, which valves are closed? This should be isovolumic uh, relaxation as well. The other term. Right. 
So remember, whenever you're having these kind of isovolumic relaxations or contractions, like this is a period where the volume is not really changing, right? It's just the amount of force that's changing, right? The, either due to the relaxation or the uh, contraction of those muscles. Um, so again, during this period, both valves would be closed, right? Because during the relaxation, which valve should be opening? Or once you had that relaxation occur? Right, so that's during diastole, so you should have the mitral valve open up, and that will allow blood to flow via gravity through the uh, left atria into the left ventricle. But during that relaxation, the isovolumic relaxation, you had the aortic pressure becomes high enough to close the aortic valve, right? But the pressure is not dropped low enough to where the mitral valve is going to open up. Okay, so during the isovolumic relaxation, you have both valves are going to be closed. Okay, on the other hand, if you had isovolumic contraction, which valves are open or closed? They're still both closed, right? Because you have not had high enough pressure to open up that single lunar valve, the aortic valve. Okay. All right. So again, it's a very brief period, but it's important to know kind of what's, what's going on during each phase. All right. Which of the following would cause passive immunity? So all the other ways are good ways to get active immunity, right? So even if you make a virus less virulent by making a, an attenuated but live form, even if an inactivated virus is kind of the dead form of it, you still get active immunity because your body is producing, is learning how to be immune against that pathogen. Uh, but in some cases, we'll inject like the immune globulin that's already active against the pathogen in order to give the patient some passive immunity for the short term. Does that make sense? Imagine if we're giving like snake antivenom or if we're giving rabies immune globulin or hepatitis B immune globulin, all that's giving the patient a, a temporary passive immunity uh, to that uh, pathogen. Okay. Right. Increased activity of the nitric oxide uh, has what effect on the CV system? Again, I was running into character limit. So uh, if you have more nitric oxide activity going on, what's going to happen to the cardiovascular system? You guys remember what drug affects this system? Yeah, remember nitroglycerin? The vasodilates, right? So when we give nitroglycerin patients who are having chest pain, they're usually not having enough oxygen delivery to the myocardium. Uh, so what we can do is dilate those vessels to allow for uh, better flow of oxygenated blood to the tissue, right? Um, so what would that do to afterload? Typically decrease it, right? Yeah, it also has some venous dilation as well, so that can actually end up having uh, some decreases in preload, uh, and the main action does can be vasodilatory. Make sense? Also, the nitric oxide pathway, uh, working through cyclic GMP, if you guys remember, secondary messenger, right? All these classes come together at some point. Okay, and then finally, a patient presents to the ER with a massive hemorrhage. What type of blood can he receive? Be a quick one. I don't know if you guys can see that. It's AB positive, AB negative, O negative, O positive. O negative is the right answer there. Why is it not O positive? 
Yeah, so you don't know the patient. So when you have these patients come in, like secondary to trauma or something, you don't have time to sit there and, and type and cross match them. That would be nice if you have time, but in a lot of cases you don't. So you always have O negative at the ready, so you can give that to your patient. Uh, you're very safe uh, to assume they're not going to have a reaction to it. Uh, they can receive that safely. Okay. All right. He potentially could receive any of them, depending on what his actual blood type is. But to be safe, you do O negative. All right. See, the winner is Cedar one. Who's Cedar? You guys are working together all the time? No, you're just sort of trying to take credit. Riding on the coattails. That's what I did most of my career. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how about mahogany? Wow, we have... Nice. Trying to go after after my last name. To... Yeah, I like that. Uh, and then Rach. Very nice. Good job, guys. Uh, you get your free answer for the test. It is... Not G. Uh, it's A. There you go. At least one A will be on the test. There you go. The joke only gets more funny the more I do it. So. Yeah. Yes, sir. So I just want to make sure. So isovolemic fraction and isovolemic relaxation, they both both valves are closed. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. So both valves are going to be closed in each situation. Any other questions I can answer? All right. Uh, I will probably be leaving around noon today uh, since I have to come in tomorrow. Um, so I'll try to answer questions via email if you don't catch me before then. Uh, as late as I... Probably go to bed around 11-ish, so try to get them in before then, otherwise I will be asleep. See you guys tomorrow.